On the 16th of February, 1934, powers of government in Newfoundland were handed over officially from the House of Assembly in St. John's to a commission of government. Never again would Newfoundland's parliament have a prime minister or be the supreme legislative body over Newfoundland. And for the next 15 years, until confederation with Canada, Newfoundland would not have a democratically elected government. This did not come out of nowhere. Rather, the end of responsible government was a slow and stumbling 19-year fall from grace, with the Dominion's unpayable debt laying the final nail in the coffin. In 1914, along with the rest of the British Empire, Newfoundland joined World War I. Before this point, the total debt in Newfoundland was $30.5 million, mostly the result of a popular but expensive railway that ran through the Dominion's vast interior. Four years later, by the time the war was through, the national debt increased by a whopping $13 million to a hefty sum of $43 million. And all in all, about $35 million of debt was attributed to the war. As Newfoundland entered the 1920s, the government freely borrowed large amounts of money, some due to the collapse of the company which operated the railway, and much for public services, which were expanding as prices for Newfoundland goods in trade fell. The only respite for Newfoundland's floundering economy was the slight economic diversification from its fishing-dependent economy to include some forays into mining. By the time Newfoundland's economy was collapsing and its public debt becoming nigh unpayable, many Newfoundlanders had become disillusioned with the political situation, and the government seemed more corrupt than others around, even if the only difference was publicity in that corruption. Especially to the elite mercantile class, who had been skeptical of democratic government since its introduction in the 1830s. This frustration increased significantly throughout the roaring, not for Newfoundland, 20s, as unstable governments failed to stay around or make good strides in reducing or slowing the budget deficit, and some very public incidents of corruption gave the political scene a reputation for being very corrupt. In 1924, the government of Prime Minister Sir Richard Squires fell apart amid an outside investigation which recommended he be charged criminally. The man who replaced Squires was deeply unpopular after cutting taxes on the wealthy and raising import duties, so much so that the public re-elected Squires only four years later into the office that he was forced to resign from. The absolute collapse of the already struggling economy came with the crash in the global economy that Newfoundland relied heavily upon for trade. The crash meant that Newfoundland's export earnings were halved from 40 to $23.5 million, and its fishery earnings fell by more than 60% to a meager $6 million. This meant that Newfoundland would have to rely even more upon debt to help pay bills that were quickly skyrocketing as companies could no longer afford to pay employees. However, loans became harder to come by compared to the free dealing of the 20s, and the government could barely afford to feed meager rations to the now quarter of its population that relied upon government assistance and struggled to avoid bankruptcy. As 1931 rolled into 1932, a political crisis blew up in the Squire's administration. On the 1st of February, Finance Minister Peter Cashin resigned, accusing the Prime Minister of removing mention of details in Executive Council minutes to hide the fact that he was paying money to lawyers out of public funds. Along with a failure by his government to investigate the Prime Minister properly, as he steadfastly refused to resign, as he had done in 1923, the public became very frustrated with the government culminating in the decision to march to the legislature by many in St. John's. On the 5th of April, crowds marched to the Colonial Building, the House of Government, and by the time they arrived at the legislature, they became riotous, impatient with the House of Assembly. The crowd trashed the building, and the Prime Minister resigned after only barely escaping seething crowds. After the resignation of PM Squires, an election was held to find a government that would replace him. 
merchant Frederick Alderdice was elected on the promise that his government would look into transferring power into a commission and suspending the constitution until conditions became better in Newfoundland. These sorts of measures were supported by the working class and the elite mercantile alike, with the poor resenting the politicians taking the money out of the treasury for themselves while they were near starving and the ones taking most of the impact of the depression. This is the frustration that boiled into action taken by rioters at the colonial building in St. John's as opposed to action via voting. After coming to power, Alderdice found no way to secure any more loans for Newfoundland and suggested a default. This was opposed by Canada as Newfoundland used their dollar and they feared for their banks, as well as Britain who feared it would have significant ramifications on the economic status in the empire as a whole and so they both funded debt payments while Canada and the UK could have a royal commission investigate what the best course of action would be. The Amori Royal Commission, made up of three members appointed by the UK, Canada, and Newfoundland respectively, published a report in the end of 1933 suggesting that democratic government be suspended until Newfoundland had a balanced budget and the people wanted elected government again. Because of the collapse of trust in the Newfoundland government, this proposal was widely praised by Newfoundlanders, and they thought that it was reasonable to trade elected government for financial aid, as they saw it was a bargaining chip in a larger game for themselves. And so, without any vote on insistence made by Britain, Alderdice and his House of Assembly passed a resolution on the 28th of November, 1933, to hand powers of government over to a commission starting in the middle of February 1934. And so, on the 16th of February, the House of Assembly breathed its last breath as a national legislator in Newfoundland, and the era of commission government began.